I see we have more than 24 participants now, 25. We're just letting people in, then we'll start. Great. Rory, how, one, how long do you want your opening remarks to be for? I would have thought I'd try to keep them to sort of 10, 15 minutes if I can. Oh, that'd be great. We've got a lot of very good people on, in the list, so it'd be yeah. good to hear comments yeah. from around the floor. OK, let, let's give it a go. Let, let's start off. Welcome, everybody. I'm Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform. Delighted to introduce uh, our speaker, Rory Stewart, to take part in a seminar on the future of British foreign policy. This was advertised as an off the record event, but Rory's just said he's happy to be on the record. So it is on the record and we are gonna record this. We are gonna put it on our website afterwards. I think Rory needs some very little introduction. He was Secretary of State for Development in Theresa May's government, formerly a foreign office minister, formerly a long and interesting career in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the author of many interesting books. Uh, Rory, you want to talk today about the future of British foreign policy. So we're going to ask you to speak for 10 or 15 minutes, then we'll have a free and frank discussion afterwards. So over to you, Rory. Well, thank you very, very much. And thank you for having me. And Charles, can I be mean and ask if you could mute for your crackly microphone just for a second and then come back on again, if that allows if you're able to do that. Great. Um, well, thank, thank you so much for having me. Um, as, as Charles said, I'm going to try to be as, as brief as I can and then open up. Um, but let, let me just start with some framing remarks on thinking through British foreign policy. The first, I think, is to understand that the way that we think about foreign policy, and I, perhaps this is connected to the way that we think about domestic policy, is far too focused on the question of the what, right, our objectives, and not focused enough on the how and the who. And, and what I mean by that is that we still seem to be stuck in a very, very strange world where we think that creating a foreign policy is about defining some grand objective, which could be human rights or could be peacekeeping or could be fighting for liberal democracy against authoritarianism. And that all we then need to do is come up with some formal definition of an institutional structure, sort of project management tool, a very technocratic solution and somehow we're going to end up at that end point. And the odd thing is that this illusion is shared not just by countries like the United Kingdom, but countries like the United States and even countries like Denmark, a very strange way of looking at the world. In truth, of course, the, the fundamental questions that we have in foreign policy start from the question of taking on board a rather negative question, what we cannot do, right? what can't be done, what we struggle to do in the world. And this is a difficult thing to start with because our culture is really allergic to that kind of conversation. If you start talking about what we cannot do, people get very gloomy and accuse you of pessimism and uh, rejecting hope. But starting with what you cannot do brings you to focus on the question of power, power in foreign policy. And power in foreign policy is fundamentally not a question only of resources, so not a question of money and troops, but is a question of knowledge and legitimacy. And somewhere in that, a question of people and the way that people operate. Right, let's finish, that's my theoretical frame. Let me now charge forward away from the theory into some attempt to, to bring this to life. So the first thing I think for framing UK foreign policy is to focus on what we have failed to do globally over the last 20 years, really focus on the negative parts of that picture. And we can come on to the positive parts of the picture in a bit, but let's focus on the negative parts of the picture first. But the first problem that we faced over the last 20 years is the slowing in the expansion of democracy. 1988 to 2003, the number of democracies in the world grows steeply. In fact, in that first decade, there's a growth of about 27% largely driven by developments in Eastern Europe and Latin America. From 2003 onwards, the number of free liberal democracies in the world actually begins to decrease so that we're now back 
today at about the level we were at in 1998. Right? So that's 20 years essentially of stagnation. At the same time, we've had to deal with the extraordinary rise of China and China has broken a loss of our beliefs, which were very, very central to the way we thought about things in the 1950s and 60s, but actually maybe even more fundamentally central to the way that we've thought about things for the last 200 years. For nearly 200 years, there seemed to be a clear uh, correlation between economic growth and the development of liberal democratic systems until about 2000. And uh, if you were Seymour Lipset, if you were looking at these things, you would have predicted that as countries like China developed a middle class, got to a certain GDP per capita, it was almost inevitable that they would begin to move in a liberal democratic direction. Now, today, we don't feel like that very much, but many, 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 many people felt like that very recently. Right? 20 years ago, that was not uncommon. And I, I'm not gonna bore you by trying to remind you of all the Economist articles that you all would have churned through 20 years ago telling you exactly that. Today, we are in a much more gloomy place. We're in a situation in which China's success has challenged some of our fundamental assumptions about the direction of societies. And it has meant that the appeal, not just to places like China, but the appeal of places like Singapore or Dubai is very, very uh, dramatic in the developing world. I remember that we did an opinion poll in Iraq, for example, in 2005, asking Iraqis what country they admired most, which they would most likely be. And I think the answer was about 5% of them wanted the United Kingdom, 3% of them wanted France, less than 3% wanted Britain, but an incredible number dreamt of Dubai, an autocratic monarchy uh, as their model of a state. This was an uncomfortable realization at a moment of which we were spending nearly 100 billion US dollars a year in Iraq and had over 100,000 foreign troops on the ground and over 100,000 foreign consultants. So that then touches on the second thing that's happened over the last 20 years, which is in essence, the age of intervention, which ran in my mind roughly from 1990 to 2010 came to an end. And for me, teaching now, uh, in Yale, I'm teaching uh, in an international policy school. Having taught at Harvard 12 years ago, it's absolutely extraordinary. The entire uh, curriculum 12 years ago was dominated by people talking about humanitarian intervention, counterinsurgency warfare strategy. There were American generals in and out all the time. Samantha Power was talking, responsibility to protect was everywhere. And now suddenly I find myself teaching students who uh, regard that world, which was only 12 years ago, as being a complete alien planet. It's almost inconceivable today in the American Academy that anybody would wish to take a course in humanitarian intervention or imagine uh, putting those kinds of boots on the ground. And somewhere wrapped into this is, of course, uh, the trauma of the Arab Spring. The hopes that the Arab Spring produced and what then followed. And um, in particular, our struggles to deal with Libya, our struggles to deal with Syria, and our struggles dealing with Yemen. Right, finish that. Framing UK foreign policy then, just to accelerate to what I hope is a conversation. Britain now looking at the world, tries to locate itself somewhere on a spectrum between the United States and Denmark in thinking about this world and thinking about the problems of the last 20 years. Insofar as Britain sees itself as Denmark, it might use the kind of language that you can see uh, in Danish statements about foreign policy. So Denmark would say that its foreign policy is there to support sustainable development, international law, human rights, peacekeeping, and perhaps a little bit of counterterrorism. So Danish view of the world. And there are bits of the British system which echo some of those concerns certainly differed was supposed to echo the concern around sustainable development. On the other hand, if you look at the United States and the new Biden administration, uh, their vision is very much still centered around the idea of whether it is possible to champion a Western liberal democratic model against authoritarian and populist challenge. There is disagreement within the Biden administration on how hard they go against China, 
But that disagreement is largely a question of how much they think they can do. They all agree that China represents the major geostrategic challenge for the United States. And if you read a recent article in The Atlantic written by a very well-informed Brookings Institution uh, analyst, you can see them also leaning into questions of populism. So the United States is talking about uh, the possibility of supporting Macron uh, against possible challenges from Le Pen. There's interest in engaging with issues in Hungary and Poland, Turkey, et cetera. The problem for Britain, the problem for Britain is that most of this conversation misses the stuff that I began with. It begins with grand objectives, which in the case of the Danish model could be human rights or sustainable development, and the American model could be challenging liberal democracy, but it completely misses the question of the who and the how, the question of the people. And that's where Britain is fundamentally crippled. And if one wanted a vision for UK foreign policy going forward, it has to begin with people. It has to begin firstly with acknowledging that our foreign service is half the size of the French foreign service. It has to begin with acknowledging the fact that DFID, or what remains of DFID, has far fewer people on the ground than its German equivalent. If you look at someone like Zambia, DFID will have about nine UK-based staff on the ground, the Germans, through GTZ, have over 130 German officials on the ground working on a program which is actually smaller in financial terms, but just much bigger in human terms. This is the theme I keep coming back to. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because foreign policy debates and grand strategy aside, we are always, as Britain, going to be in the world. Right? Our presence in these countries is quite extraordinary. If you look at a small country like Malawi, a recent survey discovered that there were over 1,250 Scottish charities alone actively involved in the single country of Malawi. Right, so that's one small part of the United Kingdom with 5 million people, and Malawi, one of the poorest states in the world, and over 1,200 charities involved. When I tried as the Different Secretary of State to document the number of NHS doctors who went to Malawi to work during the year, again, the number was in the thousands. But Britain does nothing really to make sense of these existing connections, harness our existing relationships with these countries, because the model which I began by criticizing, an incredibly rigid technocratic project management driven model with grand abstract objectives and very, very few staff on the ground, means that it's impossible for the Foreign Office, which in summer like Zambia has only two UK-based staff, or DFID, to actually begin to have the time or the flexibility to actually engage with all the rich interactions between Britain and Malawi, or Britain and Zambia. And that means that everything that could make foreign policy over the next 20 years genuinely interesting, which is the subtle intricate relationships between cultural programs, development programs, trade, business, shared objectives, work in multilateral institutions, whether in the WHO or the United Nations, all the things that ought to bring our relationship with Malawi or Zambia, or indeed Myanmar alive, are, are largely lacking because the system uh, has misunderstood its role. The British uh, foreign policy system continues to imagine that what it's trying to do is either fight for liberal democracy on the American model or on the Danish model, get involved in trying to advocate for human rights, international laws and sustainable development, rather than actually thinking about the type of culture it needs to develop and the type of people it needs to have on the ground in order to consider a genuinely fruitful partnership over the next 20 years. Right. Uh, with those slightly aggressive and grand statements, I'm going to stop and hand over to questions where maybe I can develop uh, my pompous themes in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. Um, you've covered a lot of ground, uh, but I'm sure we'll we'll cover even more ground in the next hour or so. Um, who'd like to kick off with a comment or a question? You can either raise your hand or you can send me a message on chat to ask something. Uh, let me perhaps kick off with one of my own then while others are working out what they want to say. Um, 
the UK talks quite a lot about the D10, this which is supposed to be the G7 plus South Korea, Australia and India, a kind of democratic big boys club or big, big persons club. Um, I guess what one thesis is, one possible uh, uh, thesis is that because China is becoming so difficult to deal with for so many countries and behaving in ways that many of them find unacceptable, that the groups of countries that are not China will start to become more important in the world. We're seeing the, the so-called quad between India, America, Japan and Australia becoming a more important uh, body organizing naval exercise and perhaps developing a political side too. You've got the, 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 the CPTPP, this, the, what used to be called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which doesn't have America in it yet, although Biden might rejoin, but doesn't have China in it. And some people take that seriously. Biden's talked about a conference of democracies. So do, do you think it's really viable, Rory, that we were going to see bodies in the world that are kind of uh, aimed to contain or exclude China becoming more important? Is that really viable or feasible, given that um, issues like climate change or the Iran nuclear problem or pandemics can't be dealt with without the likes of China, even if their behavior is, is to us unacceptable at times. So does it make sense to have organizations and bodies that don't include China? Yeah. Well, let's, 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 um, let's look at that for a second. I mean, I think there are three separate questions there. I think the first is, what exactly could Britain's role be in this? How much can Britain really do in relation to China? And, and there I would say, Britain's role in that is likely to be modest and marginal. I mean, one of the reasons I'm concerned with this uh, extraordinary increase in investment in our naval capacity is I can't actually see a realistic world in which Britain starts using its ships to confront China and the Pacific. But I do think there are things that Britain and Europe can do together at the margins uh, to think about intellectual property trade and deal with challenges such as the 5G challenge from Huawei. So the can. The second question I think about this democracies against China model uh, is the one that you've absolutely put your finger on, which is that many of the issues that we really care about, we have to involve China in. Um, but the third issue, which I think is a more difficult issue, is if you wanted to be um, a realist, if we're serious about challenging China, it probably isn't going to work if you try to draw the dividing lines in the world between democracies and non-democracies. Because many of the, the countries who you would wish to have as potential allies in that conversation are not democracies. And indeed the danger of making the opposition to China a club of democracies is that you may well drive into China's camp and into China's hands. Many of the countries that you would want to have on your side. And perhaps, uh, you know, to look at relatively non-controversial examples of that. Traditionally, uh, UK, US policy would expect to have countries in the Middle East broadly within its orbit in that conversation. But if you set it up in a way that actually um, the Gulf monarchies find themselves no longer included in the club and no longer part of what it means to have a global response to China, you may find yourself in real trouble. Thank you, thank you very much, I agree with that. Now, a number of people are now asking questions. I'll start off with Lord Hannay. David, do, uh, do unmute yourself and then we'd like to hear what you have to say. Yeah, Rory, very good to hear you. Um, can we talk a little bit about Britain's relationship on foreign policy issues with the other countries in Europe? Uh, would you, first of all, subscribe to the view that uh, it is simply inconceivable that we can have a meaningful foreign policy which does not take account of our foreign policy alliances or tensions or whatever you, with the other countries in Europe. Uh, it has been so for several, many hundred years and it's not gonna change just because your old party or your party uh, has been taken over by some swivel-eyed um, anti-Europeans. But having said that, how do we manage this? I mean, clearly, even this government uh, that we have now understands that you have to work closely with the French and the Germans. Look, for example, at the way we handle the JCPOA and Iran and so on. But they have apparently decided that we're going to have absolutely nothing to do with the European Union 
as such. Uh, and Charles is deputy or not deputy, sorry, his foreign policy person. Ian Bond wrote a very good paper recently explaining just how, uh, how what a vacuum there was in relationship with the EU as an institution, which after all takes some quite important foreign policy decisions, either negative ones or positive ones. Positive ones when it puts sanctions on, uh, negative ones when it fails to rise to a particular challenge in an adequate manner. Perhaps Belarus could be an example of that. So uh, what do you think British foreign policy, if you accept the first part of my question, that we cannot disengage it from a meaningful engagement with the other countries in Europe, uh, should it be, as the present government is trying to do, distinguish between uh, with bilateral relations and uh, those with the European institutions, or should we really settle down to a much more sophisticated approach which plays with both the institutions and the main players in Europe? So, uh, thank you. I mean, my instinct on this is that Europe has to be our central strategic partner. And rebuilding that relationship and being very, very thoughtful about how we partner with Europe, both in terms of our diplomats in Europe, but also in terms of the way that we frame our embassies and our development projects abroad, working alongside the European Union, is going to be absolutely critical. I would hope that a British ambassador would see their EU colleagues as being their key interlocutors in, in most of these countries abroad. Um, but th there are two problems here. One of them is that uh, we've done an enormous amount of damage to our relationship with Europe. I mean, I was, I was very struck when I was the foreign, foreign office minister going to deal with um, Europe on the question of Afghanistan. I turned up to a EU conference after Brexit with I think nearly 400 million pounds worth of contribution and found uh, that we were completely sidelined and marginalized by a, and a real sense that this was because Europe was for very understandable reasons, extremely angry, very reluctant to actually give us a seat at the top table, despite the fact that we were coming with quite a lot of contribution to that table. Um, I think the second problem is a domestic political problem, which is that British politics incredibly binary. I mean, the, the, the center ground ought to be people saying, okay, we're leaving the European Union, but we're going to remain very, very close to Europe. We're going to try to be kind of as close to Europe politically and diplomatically as we possibly can. And using comparisons with Norway or, you know, perhaps if it's more of a customs union model, Turkey. But the problem is that that language, that world, is under such strain uh, in Britain. I mean, it really does feel as though British public opinion, all the views are at the extremes and there's almost nobody interested in defining a close intimate relationship with Europe after Brexit. From the Remain side, because people are just so angry and they just want to remain in the European Union, they don't want to think about what a soft Brexit could have looked like. And from the hard Brexit side, because they somehow believe that this is about becoming Singapore. So I, I think, um, I absolutely agree with you. This is, has to be what we lean into. We have to massively increase our diplomatic presence in Europe. We have to put a huge emphasis on being Europe's key partner around the world. But to do that, we've got some very formidable problems with the Europeans and with the British public or British politics. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, David. I'm now going to, uh, we had a written question coming from Simon Maxwell. Simon, would you like to ask your question? If not, I can read it out for you, but if, if you could unmute yourself or if, if not, just ask me to read it out. Simon. Made it, thank you. Can well you hear me? Yes. Uh, I thought the, the emphasis on power and knowledge and people was really interesting. And I absolutely endorse what you said about the need to build dense networks of relationship and knowledge and partnership between us and, and other countries. But I'm slightly taken aback by the idea that the way forward in places like Zambia, Malawi, or come to that France or Germany 
is to replicate the kind of technical assistance, you know, density that hasn't been common in the development business for 40 years, never mind 20. And so I just wonder whether there are other ways to develop close collaboration which recognize the fact that Zambia today is not the Zambia of 40 years ago. It has much greater institutional capacity, it has more universities, more think tanks, uh, far more partnerships with the UK than maybe existed in those days. And of course, th that kind of knowledge needs to be reciprocal. So Zambians need to know about the UK as much as we need to know about Zambia. Uh, so we could do that through business links, but also through university links, research links, scholarships, all sorts of ways. Having nurses who spend some time in the UK and the NHS and then go back to Zambia. So my question to you really is how to create the kind of dense networks which benefit us but also benefit other people that don't rely on sending either box wallows or you know agronomists from here to try and teach the Zambians how to do it. Um, so I think it's a very good challenge from Simon and definitely what we ought to be trying to do is not to replicate what we were trying to do 40 years ago and we have to acknowledge that countries have changed enormously. Um, I think there is a uh, more of a space for technical assistance than Simon does, partly because we are spending an enormous amount of money in those countries, and we have very few people on the ground to actually monitor the quality of those programs. So one of the things that was very striking to me as a different section of state is just how bad in practice so many of the programs were when you looked at them. And that was partly because in Malawi, for example, we'd be operating under a manifesto commitment to educate 100 million girls worldwide and we'd be very proud that 90 percent of girls in Malawi were now in education for seven years and not focusing on the fact that of those girls 85 percent couldn't read or write at the end of seven years in education so I, I think we shouldn't kid ourselves into believing that somehow the institutional capacity in somewhere like Malawi is so extraordinary that there is no place for technical assistance and that Britain can somehow uh, fulfill a technocratic dream of just writing large checks to the Ministry of Education and somehow be confident uh, that that's going to deliver impact on the ground. So, so there I do slightly disagree. Where I agree though is in this question of the dense network and my small refinement uh, to Simon's uh, challenge is that it needs to be guided. I mean, one of the problems is that it's very tempting for civil servants when they hear that we've got all these networks and connections to just think, oh, well, we'll let a thousand flowers bloom and we'll flop and we'll just let it happen. And we don't need to do anything. There is an incredible amount to be gained by harnessing and guiding the process of all those informal connections. I see this again and again in my life, right? I mean, I see this whether you're dealing with trying to uh, uh, deal with the fact that there are 15,000 charities in Britain that work with prisons, and yet there's nobody inside the prison who actually has the job of trying to coordinate the activities of those charities within the prison walls. Um, generally speaking, the idea that you just let a thousand flowers bloom it is actually a sort of weird liberal technocratic fantasy. What we actually need, and this is where really smart people who know Zambia well and who are British and who are thinking about British interests and Zambian interests and who have really developed a vision of what the 20 years on the ground will be like is essential. And my answer to that is that we should be setting up British development foundations which are independent, right? these arm length bodies independent of the British government, funded by the British government, but which have their own CEOs and who have the mandate to spend 20 years thinking about what they want to do in those contexts. Thank you. Before we leave the subject of develop, development to, to talk about other issues, I'd like to bring in another written question from Simon Lightfoot, who has another question about Britain's foreign aid budget. Uh, Simon, would you like to unmute yourself and, and say, say what you'd like to say, please? Can you unmute yourself or can we help to unmute Simon? Simon Lightfoot? Yes. If, if not, I can, I can read out Simon's question. Perhaps that's better if I do that. I'll read out the question. In light of the decision to revise the foreign aid target, how would Mr. Stewart minimise the fallout on Britain's foreign policy and its relations with countries in the developing world? That's Simon Lightfoot's question. I mean, I, I think it's um, 
going to be very difficult. I think the great advantage of the 0.7% is that it did at least protect a part of public policy, which is very difficult to protect. I mean, it's uh, the reason we set targets for international development and to some extent for the 2% on defense is that left to their own devices, quite understandably, there will always be pressures on the NHS, which will always lead to people cutting those kinds of programs. And once you've lost a defense of those programs, it's quite difficult to sustain them. And you can see that in the Foreign Office, which isn't ring-fenced, didn't have a budget, and is now, I mean, just critically, miserably underfunded. I mean, to take my example of Zambia, we've gone from, when I was in, in, in the Foreign Office in 1995, we had 26 UK-based staff in Zambia, we now have two. It's an extraordinary, very, very rapid change replicated across a, a great deal of wealth. Um, so how do we respond to this? I would suggest that um, the way to do it is to focus on sweet spots. If you've got less money, you have to focus on where Britain can make a difference. And I would suggest that that uh, might involve rethinking our presence in giant countries. I'm a little bit skeptical about what we think we're doing, spending 400 million pounds in Pakistan, 400 million pounds in Nigeria, because the scale of those countries is such that it's difficult for me to quite see the impact that we've had. 400 million pounds in Pakistan is 1% of the budget of the Pakistan military. 400 million pounds in Nigeria is zero, sorry, 0.01% of the budget, of, sorry, 0.1%, 0.1% of the budget of the GDP of Nigeria. In other words, GDP in Nigeria is about uh, 500 billion and 400 million is one, uh, less than one thousandth of that. That means that in those kinds of countries, you're increasingly driven to focus, for example, in Nigeria, on doing small vocational projects in a particular province like Kaduna, because you realize that with only one one thousandth is the GDP of the country, you can't have much impact across the country as a whole. I would tend to retreat from those kinds of contexts and focus instead on countries where Britain has not just the historical connections, but the good relationships, the goodwill, and the momentum to make a difference. So I would be very interested, for example, in leaning into places like Ghana, rather than as Diffid would be tempted to do, saying, well, because this country is on the verge of middle income status, we should be leaving it. Very, very good answer. Well, do, do aim for the sweet spots. And I turn to Sir Robert Cooper. Robert, uh, you're, on, you're on off mute, so do far ahead. I unmute myself. Um, uh, maybe I could say uh, two things. First of all, um, <clears throat> I, I like very much listening to what Rory was saying about the way things work on the ground <clears throat> and the um, enormous number of people that there are there all doing their own little thing and it not amounting to very much. But on the, de on the development aid side, um, I long ago um, uh, produced a short paper in the Foreign Office which plotted uh, this was the Foreign Office, not DFID, um, which plotted uh, development aid against GNP growth per head, development aid received against GNP growth per head, and there was a very strong correlation, and it was in 100% negative. Um, and the conclusion I drew was that um, aid was not actually very much to do with development, it was to dealing, it was about dealing with the consequences of not having developed. And the ones who developed mostly did it on their own. Um, now, it, uh, and that's why actually some of the things we're doing may be the right things. Maybe we're dealing with the problems which development uh, has created where there is development. Maybe we're trying to kickstart something where it's not. Um, uh, but I'm also struck, I, the, uh, the, the other question I would want to ask about that is how does one match that bit of foreign policy um, with the real politique bit of foreign policy, the bit about um, uh, the bit about kind of getting your hands on the government's throat and getting them to do what you want? So that's my first question. The second question is entirely a different one, and that's about um, that's about democracy, um, uh, and I don't know how the um, how the kind of competition with China is going to play out. But 
the difference between China and us now is increasingly significant in the political field. Um, the, uh, the advice that Kennan gave in the long telegram was whatever you do, um, the most important thing is to preserve your own democracy. Um, but what we see in the West at the moment is not particularly healthy. Um, uh, Rory has talked about the binary politics in this country. Well, it looks pretty binary in the USA as well. Um, and uh, if at least a part of the competition with China is going to be about democracy versus autocracy, maybe someone should start thinking about how well our democracies work. I mean, th th these are three very fundamental challenges by Robert. Um, the first one, which is the question of whether development aid actually does or does not contribute to sustainable GDP growth, is is a you know a brutal fundamental question that hits right at the heart of DFID's mission and mandate, and it's a really difficult one, and it's one that I think DFID, for, for understandable reasons, doesn't want to look at too closely. I couldn't get them. I had a big research budget, huge research budget, and I tried to get them to fund a study on what we'd actually spent money on in Malawi over the last 40 years and what it had actually achieved and met the most incredible institutional resistance to trying to do that kind of analysis because I fear, and civil servants probably suspected that the answer would not be a very pretty one. Um, but I, you know, that's a much, much bigger question about international development, which maybe we can touch on later. Um, suffice it to say, I, you know, I sympathize with some of what Robert's saying there. The question of naked power, what Robert calls in rather sort of uh, unpolitically correct terms, getting your hands on the throat of another country is a very interesting one. My sense is that our ability to do that declines all the time. And I certainly don't feel that our development aid made much difference to that. Uh, but it's not just a problem for Britain, it's a problem for the United States as well. I was very struck in Tanzania, for example, dealing with President Magafuli, who has just run another incredibly flawed, brutal election, which is a very sad example of backsliding in Tanzania, which was one of the hopes for African democracy. I went in with a package again, of, I think of almost 400 million pounds worth of development assistance, trying to use it in engagements with President Magafuli to get him to rethink both aspects of politics, democratization, political liberty, and questions of the investment climate, and entirely failed. I was complaining to the American ambassador about this, wondering whether they had more success, and they explained that uh, Magafuli had refused to speak to John Kerry when he was Secretary of State. The US ambassador had then refused to visit Magafuli. The US ambassador had then been thrown out of Tanzania, and the Americans had then returned with their tail between their legs with $1 billion worth of international assistance to try to buy their way back into Magafuli's good grace. And it was an extraordinary parable, right? Because Tanzania is an extremely poor country. And if a country like the United States feels that it has to go back with its tail between its legs and a billion dollars to try to get itself back into its good graces, it's really beginning to show the extent to which even countries which are really not very strong economically or politically are increasingly resistant to any type of external interference. I lived through this painfully again, trying to have some influence over President Managagwa in terms of the transition in Zimbabwe. The only solution to this then is not thinking about uh, the hand around the neck. The solution of course is uh, to think more in terms of a metaphor of holding hands. And there the key is having presence on the ground. And I uh, was very struck in a recent uh, discussion with the diplomat in UAE but he very much said, the reason we don't pay much attention to Britain is you're not really here. And what he meant by that is France had a thousand soldiers on the ground, it had an enormous number of planes on the ground, it was investing hugely in the Louvre in the UAE, but they just felt that they were there with them and they felt that Britain was very distant, which brings me back in a neat circle to my basic story about people and capacity and presence, that our best hope is not to imagine that we have carrots and sticks which can bully countries to do what they don't want to do. Our best hope is that we can occasionally identify a shared interest and maybe by holding hands, steer them a little bit off the path they were going on. Um, 
I, I, my answer will be too long if I then deal with the preserving your own democracy, but suffice to say, I agree with Robert. We are in a huge problem with our democracies at home. I think we can all agree with that. Turn now to Mark Boliat. Mark, do unmute yourself, please. Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Rory. I want to go back to David Hannay's comments and then look forward. A Swiss diplomat said at a meeting I was at years ago that if you leave the European Union, afterwards relations between Britain and the European Union will get even worse because you'll be in a permanent state of negotiation. Your thoughts on that, please? <laughs> well, I think, Mark, I think, um, I, I think uh, that is extremely likely and I think it's a very wise observation. I got that, but it's a dimension which I think people need to focus on more. We tend to imagine that uh, obviously all the time that Brexit is some sort of a steady end state. There was this extraordinary thing that uh, the Prime Minister did during the election where he talked about his oven ready deal. Of course, in retrospect, he wasn't really talking about a deal at all. He was talking about the withdrawal agreement. Right? And there's nothing oven ready at all. And Mark, you've, you've just put your finger on the <laughs> The big issue, which is that if you're in a permanent state of negotiation, which it's probably very plausible we will be, uh, that really uh, doesn't increase your chance of being able to dig, uh, beg favors, put pressure, and collaborate cheerfully because you're always out for something. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Yeah, just to um, uh, elucidate on Mark's point, I think the same Swiss diplomat has said quite often that at the time the Swiss had a vote on joining the European Economic Area, and I think 1991 or 1992, roughly half the Swiss wanted to join the EU, or very nearly half the Swiss did. It's now down to about 16% because they've been negotiating with the EU for the subsequent 30 or 40 years. Let's hope that's wrong. Let's hope that's wrong. Uh, now turn to uh, David Hennig. Thank, thank you, Charles. I'm afraid it was 1992, and yes, they have been negotiating ever since. But I wanted to ask about uh, China, in fact, because it was so refreshing to hear somebody talking about a, a politician, a former politician, I'm not sure, talking about China not as some kind of rival. All I hear most of the time with regard to China these these days is kind of Cold War 2.0. And I guess the question I wanted to, to ask is that there never seems to be an end state with regard to what we think China is going to become. How do you persuade your former colleagues and to change that narrative away from China as complete threat and we've got to re, ha, relive through a Cold War and change that debate to, okay, where are we trying to get to with China? What are we trying to achieve here? Um, I can see. I can see the 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 the, 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 uh, yeah, the you can the see the grimace, there. David. I mean, it's it's unbelievably difficult. But I think you've you've um, identified one of the fundamental problems in foreign policy always, which is the danger of the grand story. We love uh, Cold Wars. I mean, Cold War was a fantastic framing. It's it's the dream for all diplomats. For a start, there's a long telegram, there's a story about a genius diplomat who framed the whole thing, there's 40 years of common action, and then in 1989, there's victory. So it's the sort of absolute beau ideal of the way that we think about doing stuff. Um, it's even better, actually, than hot wars, because hopefully not quite so many people get killed. Um, and I think, uh, to some extent, the fight against Al-Qaeda, the global war on terror, was an attempt almost psychologically to find a, during that sort of 10, 15 year period, a solution to what we do now the Cold War's over. And I think the danger that we have to watch in ourselves is to make sure that this policy towards China isn't just another grand attempt to make sure that there is the right kind of framing in articles from think tanks and the way in which we train up a new Carter by finding a new enemy. I suspect uh, that the most important question in dealing with China, to, to return to where I began, is the question of can, right? what can we do about this place? So almost before one begins fantasizing about what to do, to acknowledge the extraordinary position of China. I mean, China is growing now every year by the size of the British economy. So when we get into conversations about why is China able to do all this stuff in Africa? And why can't Britain 
you know, be doing all this stuff in Africa. This difference of scale is unbelievably important. Uh, when we think about Taiwan, yeah, there's an interesting question uh, in foreign policy on our attitude towards Xi Jinping's potential ambitions in relation to Taiwan. But there's a prior question. Do we really think that we're gonna to go to war with China over Taiwan? Right? What would happen if China tried to attack Taiwan? And, and the question of the how, the can is central there. And what will, you know, what can our militaries do? What will our publics put up with? Not very much, I suspect. So I'd almost like a China policy to begin from an acknowledgement of the fact that China is a very, very grand permanent fact. And we have to return to a world of dealing with it as a permanent fact, rather than trying to uh, sort of wish it away or believe that we have somehow in our power to fundamentally change what it is. Okay, that's my, my China view. Thank you, Rory. Uh, now I turn to Sir John Holmes. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles. Uh, good afternoon, Rory. Uh, just a couple of quick comments, if I may, before a question. First of all, I was very interested in what you were saying at the beginning about the who and the how and the presence on the ground. Of course, you do have to have very clear reasons why you have people on the ground doing things. So you do need to have your objectives pretty clear if you're going to actually make good use of them. It's not just enough to have them. And I have some sympathy with Simon Maxwell's point on, on the Germans on the ground in Zambia. Secondly, on the, on the aid front, I think you were a bit hard on DFID's programs. I mean, they're, they're better than most people's, uh, even if they, some of their achievements are not always as good as they would hope them to be. And I would suggest that if we should spend more of our aid budget, particularly our small raid budget, on humanitarian aid, where, I mean, you'll recognize why I say that from my own background still. I think it's a point worth making. But my question was, was a, a more practical one and trying to sort of apply this to another field we haven't mentioned yet, which is the Middle East. And the question is, can Britain play any kind of useful role in the Middle East uh, now? I mean, it's such a mess, getting worse, and it is actually really dangerous, and I think more dangerous than we're um, saying to ourselves at the moment in the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, and the way that Israel's um, changing the nature of the game. And most of the big players there are not democracies. I mean, Israel's an exception, but that's a problem in itself. Uh, how are we going to navigate and how is the Biden administration going to navigate between these um, shoals of Iran and Saudi Arabia and Turkey playing the role that it is? And of course, Israel, which is a much bigger player in the, the area than it was before in all sorts of ways. Can we do anything useful in that area? And if so, what is it? John, uh, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, let me touch very briefly on your first two observations. Um, I think the who, how point and your point that you need to define what they're doing there is really important. But maybe there's more that we can do to justify the sort of much more generous permanent presence in terms of thinking about um, bilateral relationships in terms of much longer term view of developing a mutual sense of pride, of cultural sharing, of projects in common, uh, uh, of permanent contributions that we make in the visible. The second thing is, I absolutely agree with you on humanitarian stuff. I think one of the things that DFID does do well is responding with shelter, emergency nutrition, natural disasters. Uh, some of the very best work I've seen them do is on the South Sudanese border, for example, and on the Somali, in the context of Somalia. Uh, and actually where it tends to go wrong is in trying to get involved in running health clinics in Nigeria, where you end up with some extremely bad, bad stuff. Um, Middle East, again, there, it has to be about getting yourself in a state of grace, John. It has to be believing that were we able to develop again a generous, permanent, abiding presence in the Middle East with enough depth enough Arabists, and yes, probably some soldiers, some planes, and yes, probably much more investment in cultural projects, much more money going into university, a little bit of a leaf out of the French book, that it ought to be possible over the next five to 10 years for Britain and the United States and Europe 
to spot opportunities to nudge that region in a slightly more positive rather than negative direction. But I, I'm very, very cautious in my view here. In other words, I have a vision not of saying we're going to pick our allies, that I'm going to sit here and tell you the answer is that we're going to be able to get Bahrain going in a new direction or that maybe there's a, a future with a new leadership in UAE or maybe we've underestimated the influence that Oman and Kuwait can play on Iran. Right? I think it's much more likely to be uh, leaning into all those countries with people with practical wisdom and experience to spot the few opportunities that emerge. Right? There will be a time when it's possible to do more in Yemen than is possible at the moment. There will be opportunities that will emerge from time to time in Iran. There are things that you can do with Turkey. UAE is not entirely unreasonable. Jordan can be an interesting partner, even if it doesn't feel strong at the moment. And Israel might go in a new direction. But to harness that, it's not about uh, picking the winners now. It's about getting into a state of grace with enough really good people on the ground so that in five years time, our British discussion in the Foreign Office about Middle East policy is much more informed and much more textured than it is today. And that the opportunities we spot, we can exploit much more rapidly and nimbly. Thank you. Um, we have got, I've got a couple of more questions coming in with hands raised and one on the chat function. There is time for more questions. So if people want to chip in the questions, we can squeeze you all in and feel free to ask a second question if you've asked one already. I turn now and to uh, Ian. John, by all means, argue back or, or Robert or. Yeah, yeah. So people. Are there any of these people? I mean, I, I'm aware that I'm feeling rather out of my depth here. There's a number of my sort of grand bosses appear to be questioning me on stuff that I don't know a great deal about. So please <laughs> argue back. Well, they're very much allowed to, but I'm turning now to Ian Bond, who's my colleague at the CER. Ian, author of a recent very good, co-author of a recent very good pamphlet on the UK's relationship with the EU on foreign policy post-Brexit. Ian. Uh, thanks very much, Charles. Actually, it's not that publication that I'm going to go back to, but the, um, the one that uh, we did on the EU, the US and China. I mean, Rory, I very much take your, your point on... Um, the dangers of framing everything as a Cold War. Um, but the problem that we face now is that one of the very few things on which there is bipartisan consensus in the US is that um, China is the, the primary adversary and the most dangerous rival that the US faces. And um, that puts not just the UK, but other European allies in a rather uncomfortable position uh, where, you know, if you have to pick a side, you probably don't want to pick Xi Jinping's side, but you probably rather not pick a side at all. So, I mean, my, my question is, is it actually possible for middle-sized powers in Europe to avoid um, getting drawn into the confrontation between the, the US and China? And is there any sensible way for us to uh, to defuse it or to contribute to a more productive relationship in the longer term? Well, I mean, Ian, you're right. Uh, the, the, the starting point is that the US is obsessed with China and British foreign policy has to take that into account as does European. And I think there's an added dimension to that, which is that the with Biden facing a difficult situation in the Senate, he is going to have to uh, emphasize China in order to get Republican support for whatever he wants to do in foreign policy. So the only way for Biden to deal with a highly polarized, divided American political system in terms of foreign policy is not by talking about liberal internationalism, but by talking about China. So an enormous amount of what uh, will be done, I think, by Jake Sullivan and others, is to reframe uh, their pre-existing views on foreign policy through a China lens, an anti-China lens, and that will cause a problem for us. Um, I mean, it's presumably true, Ian, that Europe and Britain have had a very long tradition of working out how to duck, dive, and muddle through these types of confrontations. Wilson managed to avoid going to Vietnam. Uh, the Germans managed to avoid getting pulled into the horrors of Iraq. These are painful things to do, but we've got a lot of experience of being skeptical about these grand ideological confrontations and finding ways of making um, 
nice noises while trying to duck out the way. The question of whether we can ever usefully play a role in resolving these kinds of great power conflicts is a much more difficult one because we haven't had much success in the past doing this. I think there's a lovely story which we could tell ourselves about how Britain, the European Union, potentially Australia and others could work together to think about reframing that. But um, I think in reality, uh, the dimension that we need to be worried about is the way that the United States will increasingly work with Japan and South Korea. And that we will see that um, Europe will feel less necessary in this China confrontation. And it's the relationships with those enormous, powerful democratic economies uh, in East Asia, which will be central to this. Thank you. I turn now to Amelia Nayaksu. Amelia. Um, good evening. Um, thank you. Um, honestly, I was uh, I was listening with uh, a lot of attention, uh, and I'm sorry I was uh, joining the debate uh, a bit later. Uh, of course, being part of the European External Action Service, uh, of course we are more focusing on what will be the relations with the EU UK after it, uh, in the in the view of what will happen in the couple of days and weeks. Thank you so much. Oh, Charles, can you come in on that? I slightly missed a bit where Amelia's question lay there. Amelia, do you want to re repeat, repeat, summarise it? I think it's basically saying, what about the future relationship with the UK post-Brexit? Exactly. I think that, that was the gist of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. I mean, so, so my instinct, I think, and unfortunately the problem is we, we, we may be um, all preaching to the choir here, because I think we all are broadly pro-European on this call, but um, I, I think it's essential for Britain to work much, much more closely with Europe. Europe is our key strategic partner. But um, doing that is gonna be very tough, as I said, uh, largely for domestic UK political reasons, but also because I'm not sure that the goodwill is particularly there in Europe at the moment. It will take some time to rebuild the real institutional trust. Um, I think at senior levels in the European Union, people may be reluctant in practice to give Britain the kind of credibility and status that it will want, what Britain's accustomed to doing. I mean, I, this is what I was saying, I felt as a minister that we were accustomed to turning up cheerfully to an EU Afghan conference with our 400 million and being allowed to come to the dinner. And it was rather a sort of brutal um, discovery that that world seemed to have moved away. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, so we've had a, a written question from Joanna Koonsberg. Would you like to uh, make it make it yourself, Joanna, or do you want me to read it out? Do come in if you can. Just unmute yourself. Good. Hi, has that worked? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was really addressing the point about you, you make this a very strong case for taking a long term view on how to build strong bilateral relationships and very broad base um, with the UK looking at a very long, probably economic downturn. And as you've set out, I think today's political leaders opposed to making a case for how such an approach to international policy serves the national interest. From where do you think the people who might be able to take on this challenge, where, where are they going to come from? And how do you think they might overcome these material, economic and the culture war obstacles? Thanks. So I think, I mean, I think there are institutional workarounds. I mean, th this is not a, a silver bullet, but if I can just develop for a second, my idea of um, a UK development foundation on the ground in summer, like let's say Nepal, um, at the moment, the UK government spends about 100 million pounds a year in Nepal, but it's run through a DFID office under very, very strict civil service rules, which control people's security and postings in the same year. If you freed it out entirely and set up a foundation, which could be funded with half the amount of money, $50 million a year is an enormous amount of money, advertised for a chief executive to run the British Foundation in Nepal, gave them the freedom to hire their own staff to think about a 10 or 20 year program. And the UK government retained control through the money. So it would give a three year grant and every three years, dependent on what had been achieved or not, it would either give more money or less money. You would be replicating what we do with organizations like our national parks. That's how uh, the Lake District National Park works, right? The British government gives the Lake District National Park money every three years. And, but within that three years, 
the chief executive of agency national park has enormous freedom to define what to do. My instinct is that any one of us on the call would love to be the chief executive of the British Development Foundation Nepal with a, an unrestricted budget of $50 million a year to spend how you like, you know, $250 million a year over five years. And you could do an incredible amount to think very thoughtfully and creatively about the relationship between Britain and Nepal and the kind of projects that matter to you and how to really get the best bang for your buck and be a very exciting partner with the ambassador and with visiting British ministers and do it on less money than we currently have. And that may be one of the ways around the problem that John has identified with the treasury and some of the problems that other people have identified with development aid. But that's just one small example. But I think there are some institutional innovations which we could bring if we wanted to deal with this. Thank you. Um, Anthony Carey, would you like to ask you a very short question yourself? Do, um, I'm happy to read it out if you don't want to. Anthony, why don't you go for it? Uh, all, all I wanted to ask was, all I wanted to ask was, do you think that the, that does the phrase or the slogan Global Britain annoy you as much as it annoys me? The, the implication that as a result of Brexit, we can, we're back in the world and we can strut our stuff when it's, when it's clear that it has utterly diminished us just drives me mad. I wondered if it annoyed you as well. No, it, it, it's enraging. I mean, I actually, my only real argument with Boris repeatedly when he was foreign secretary and I was the minister of state is, I discovered that he told the ambassadors to write more optimistic telegrams. So I began receiving all these telegrams, which, and all of them ended, another win for global Britain, or you know, more evidence that Britain is the country that matters most in, insert Malawi, Nigeria, Pakistan, you know, whatever. And I finally called the ambassadors from the region of the world that I was supposed to be working on and said, I don't want to read this anymore. It cannot be true that Britain is the most important country in every one of your countries. Otherwise, you know, what on earth is China doing, the United States doing, anyway doing, right? Can it really be true that Britain matters more than anyone else, even in Pakistan, right? More than India, more than the United States, more than China, really? Um, so please stop doing this, right? What we want to see is, is some truth. <laughs> At which point Boris called me in and said, I'm very angry, don't do this. You know, I used to captain rugby teams and the way that you win a rugby match is you tell everybody that they're the best and you don't allow anyone to do any objective analysis of your strengths and weaknesses, just tell them they're best and they'll win. And my attempts to say to him, look, this isn't a 90 minute rugby match. These telegrams are meant to be uh, useful, uh, truthful accounts of Britain's real position in these countries on the basis of which we're going to formulate policy uh, was totally ignored. Uh, you know, he, he loves this phrase, uh, pointless boosterism. Uh, and he uses it apparently ironically, but in practice with no irony at all. Right, okay. Um, Luigi Scazzieri, my colleague from the CR, question on Turkey, Luigi. Thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, so Rory, thank you very much. At some point you mentioned that there are things that can be done with Turkey. And I just wonder whether you could expand on what it is that you were thinking also given that the UK seems to have been rather absent in the whole uh, Eastern Mediterranean crisis, leaving uh, most of the uh, mediation work to Germany and uh, leaving France to, um, to deter Turkey. Thank you. Um, so you, you, you're completely right. Britain has been very absent. I mean, let, just Luigi, just one small coder on that is that there is a reason why Britain has been absent. Uh, and some of that is entirely Britain's fault and to do with the reorientation uh, of Britain's priorities. But it's also true that Britain, for understandable reasons, has felt less welcome in these types of mediation endeavors. So the British project on the Eastern Balkans, for example, forget about the Eastern Mediterranean. On the Eastern Balkans over the last three, four years, Britain had a very frustrating and confused experience where it began to feel that actually there was not much desire from Germany, France and European Union partners for Britain to play a major role in that context. So I think there is a, there's a qualification there. Um, on, when I say there are things to be done with Turkey, I don't think I mean anything much more sophisticated than, again, Turkey is a big permanent fact. Right, and it's a country with an incredible source of strengths. 
and that part of the things that excited us about Turkey, all of us in the mid 1990s, are still there. I mean, yes, of course, in many ways, Erdogan's Turkey has been a catastrophic disappointment, right? For those of us who thought this was the great move, at the great beginning of the move for the entire Middle East towards a more liberal democratic model, that maybe Turkey was going down the route that Central Eastern Europe had gone through, all that was disappointing. But some of that is still there, right? And the Turks are still there. And there are many, many dimensions of Turkish attitudes towards Europe, uh, Turkish economic growth, Turkish geostrategic vision, Turkish relationships with Iran, Turkish perspectives on Syria, which are things with which we ought to be able to work. In fact, I go further than that, with which we have to work. And not all of those will be negative, as indeed we found in the migrant crisis. I mean, don't forget Turkey's role in the migrant crisis in the end was fundamentally positive. For all the problems, for all the things that we can complain about today, was in the end fundamentally positive. And that's one example of the many ways that we need to work with Turkey over the next 10, 15 years. Okay, thank you. Now I've got a number of few questions coming in on the chat. It's slightly easier for me if people can put their hands up because then I can see it very quickly and easily. But if, if you want to go on chat, that's okay. But I'm seeing more on the, uh, the hands function. So next on the hands function is Daniel Kerhan, formerly of the CR. Daniel. Uh, yes, hello. Thanks very much, Charles, and thank you, Rory. Uh, I had a question because you gave a very nice kind of introduction to the thinking in the Biden administration, in particular in your experience with the academy, as it were, in the US. And I had a question about the uh, UK foreign policy in the Biden administration. And despite my accent, it's not Brexit related. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Um, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis looking beyond Brexit. I've noticed recently in the UK media that Biden is a good thing for the United Kingdom. And there's a lot of areas where the US and the UK should be able to work together and so on. And, and I think that's fair. I think that's true. But what do you think could be the main areas of disagreement and potentially division uh, or, or the most problematic areas with the Biden administration beyond Brexit? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, areas where we're likely to work together, the, the two areas where Britain has correctly identified potential with the US administration are of course in climate and the environment, and in particular, Britain hosting the COP. And that as a coder is another reason why it's sad that we've cut the DFID budget most dramatically because that actually was the source of the money that we could have really used to lean into climate and environment projects internationally. Um, and the second is around this question of alliances of democracies. And there's definitely, I mean, the cliche in uh, Washington at the moment is that Biden should be prepared to work with Britain post-Brexit, provided Britain doesn't do anything to endanger the Good Friday Agreement. Right? So it's a cliche that you'll hear again and again. Um, where are the tensions likely to be? Well, I think the first thing is there's simply a, um, there is a cultural tension. I think that, many people in the Biden camp feel very bruised by Britain, by Boris Johnson, by the apparent closeness to Trump. And the American view of Brexit, as people will know, is essentially that it's simply another version of Donald Trump. So if you come from, and you know, there's many things that's wrong with that, but if you were to read the New York Times, that's fundamentally what you think. And you know, my in-laws who are you know, Biden voters, uh, find it very difficult to differentiate Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, Brexit, Trumpian policies. So there is a cultural problem. I also think that, you know, if they're looking for heroes and allies, they naturally look uh, to Angela Merkel. You know, if you look at the uh, visuals of Biden's um, videos in the presidency, the only foreign leader he shows himself with is Merkel any person that they're happy to be photographed with. And moving on from Merkel, when she moves, uh, it's Macron. They see Macron as a very interesting challenge to forces of populism and think that they need to get behind him. So I think the, 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 the problem for Britain is that a long-standing slight British, uh, American suspicion of Britain Right, which had elements of what went wrong in our partnership in Iraq and Afghanistan has now been exacerbated by the situation around Brexit. And, and I think the final thing is that 
You know, I remember Biden saying to a very good friend of mine when we were discussing Iraq back in the day um, that he totally understood Shia Sunni conflict in Iraq because his grandfather was Irish and he, as a result, he could never forgive the British. And that's why he was pessimistic about the uh, ability to resolve sectarian conflicts in Iraq because if he couldn't, as a grandson of an Irishman, forgive Britain, he couldn't see how the Shia could possibly forgive the Sunni. Now, and that's a joke that he makes quite a lot. And I think, you know, we, we don't want to put too much seriousness on it because he's a practical, grown up, thoughtful guy, but it's not, um, it's not the starting point that Britain had in its relationship between Reagan and Thatcher or potentially between Trump and Boris. Thank you. Um, ne the next question is Simon Maxwell for a second round. I, could I just say to, if John Holmes or Georg Zumkli want to turn their comments in chat into questions, could they raise their hands, please? But for now, I turn to Simon Maxwell. Yeah, thanks. Quick comment and then a, the question on this on this development foundation and Nepal thing. I'm, I'm just moderating a series of conversations about climate change between the UK and Bangladesh. And we've been absolutely insistent in all those conversations that the UK has as much to learn from Bangladesh as the as, uh, as Bangladesh has from the UK. So I, I do hope that as you pursue this idea, you'll really emphasize partnership and mutual learning. But that's just a comment. I was thinking as you were speaking that if you were the if you were the former Minister of State for San Marino or Lithuania, you wouldn't be talking in quite the same way about the world and how we might approach the problems we face. You'd be thinking in a much more multilateral way about how you could leverage any influence we had in the UN, in the Bretton Woods institutions, in NATO, uh, in the Commonwealth. And surely the kind of theoretical underpinning of your argument needs to incorporate the influence we have in those institutions and worry a bit less about what Britain is going to do about China invading Taiwan, God forbid, but more about what the world is going to do about that problem and how we build the right kind of alliances. And I, you know, I'm hesitating to make that point with both Richard Hannay and John Holmes kind of in the room, but I'm sure they would endorse that idea that multilateralism has to be central to any future thinking about UK foreign policy. Um, so th that's a good, good challenge, Sam. Um, and uh, look, I mean, your, your point about Bangladesh is, is well made, although, you know, it, not to be silly about it, is we, we have to distinguish between um, rhetoric and reality. I, I've been to a lot of conferences where we spend an enormous amount of time talking about how much we have to learn from other countries. It's extremely rare for that actually to translate into British institutions learning from other countries. Um, and as you can see with COVID, where essentially the British government found itself incapable of learning from the experience of South Korea, China, or even to some extent Germany, let alone Bangladesh. Um, so I think, Simon, be careful in saying that, in being honest with yourself about what you actually imagine that learning is going to feel like. Or otherwise you're in danger of patronizing people and pretending that you're learning from them when you're not. Um, on the question of um, multilateralism, again, I think it's very dangerous to see multilateralism as an alternative to deep bilateral relationships. Our influence within those multilateral institutions is deeply dependent on the strength of our bilateral relations. I saw this very strongly in the election uh, to the head of the WHO, where the stripping out of the British presence in Africa put us in a very, very weak position in persuading African countries to vote for our candidate in the WHO. I feel this actually as permanent members of the Security Council, the fact that we don't have significant peacekeeping troops on the ground, the fact that we now don't know really anything about Burundi or the Central African Republic uh, is a real problem. If those are the things that we're actually discussing at the table, if we've got nobody, we don't even have embassies in those places, right? If we don't have anyone on the ground, what are we really bringing to the table? Again, I mean, to take a sort of grander example, South Sudan, if we've dismantled our political intelligence network so that we no longer actually have anything serious to say about what Uganda's policy in South Sudan is and the extent to which Mustafa is or is not funding Salva Kiir, that has a real effect both on our development and humanitarian assistance, our attitude to refugees, our views on the future peace process, what we think we can do with Sudan, Kenya, and the others. So, 
we're not Lithuania, we're not San Marino, we have the capacity to actually know something about the world. And in the absence of that knowledge, our participation in these multilateral institutions uh, will have much, much less influence. Okay, um, we got the two, two last questions, firstly from John Holmes, uh, and then Jake Benford, but if somebody else wants to raise a hand, there is just time to fit in probably one or two more, but otherwise I'll turn now to John Holmes for the penultimate question. Well, thank you, Charles. I'm just responding to your challenge to come back uh, on this. On the multilateral point, I mean, obviously I do agree strongly that we, we want to move back to a position where multilateralism has more influence in the world and where we can play a, a strong role in that. The slight problem I have is that I think multilateralism is at the moment a bit of a busted flush. Biden may give it a new boost, but if Xi Jinping and Putin and various others are not really playing, it, it, it becomes uh, a lot of platitudes and not much action if we're not careful. But my question was really about how we get um, back to a situation where we might be able to put some real um, investment into not just diplomacy, it's not about the foreign office particularly, but into our presence in the world and our understanding of the world. I mean, we fell into the trap years ago of uh, the, the treasury trap of saying, well, you know, if you know more about this country, how many more widgets are we going to sell there? And of course you, you always lose in that game, you can't win. But the, I'm not sure we can get back to a situation where we can you know, argue for that sort of knowledge of countries very easily, unless we find a prime minister who's willing to think that really is worth doing uh, and worth investing in to, you know, to really have a global British foreign policy. I don't see any sign of one on the horizon for the moment, but unless we do that, I think we're going to be struggling to, to get the kind of investment that you're talking about, Rory. So it's more of a statement than a question. But, yeah, you know. so, John, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it's, it seems to me self-evident that we should not be spending half as much on our foreign services to French are, but we are, and it, has proved remarkably difficult to double that. And of course, doubling that's a tiny amount of money. I mean, we spend um, you know, about half as much on our foreign services as we spend on the winter fuel allowance. These, this is not huge sums of money within the UK budget. Uh, but, and there are opportunities. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> it, the decision to increase defense expenditure from 2% of GDP to 2.3% of GDP effectively to pay for a lot of very, a few very expensive ships and a few very expensive planes uh, was an opportunity I felt to put the money instead into our foreign office network. I don't think that these bits of equipment are any use without having the people on the ground and the people actually are much cheaper than that. So, but somehow you're absolutely right. Somehow it appears to be possible to force the treasury to spend more on buying expensive ships and planes than it is to force the treasury to spend more money on diplomats. In fact, it appears to be possible to get the treasury to spend 35 billion on extra ships and planes and not spend a billion uh, on diplomats. Um, but, 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 as you say, John, a lot of this is to do with the leadership, right? It isn't an issue which governments stand or fall over. You're right, it is marginally unpopular with the voting public and potentially with the Daily Mail to spend more on diplomats. But there are ways of explaining how, why you're doing it. You can badge some of it in terms of humanitarian assistance and poverty alleviation. You can badge some of it in terms of counterterrorism and security and global trade. And you can get away with it if you want to do it. I'm absolutely certain that a prime minister that wanted to double our diplomatic footprint could absolutely get away with it and drive it through the treasury, but it would have to be the prime minister who wanted to do it. I think it's very difficult for a foreign secretary to do, but I don't think it's politically impossible to do. Okay, I'm now, I've got, we got three last questions and I'm closing the list. Uh, Georg schulz -Zumkli, do you want to ask the question yourself? If so, do unmute yourself. If not, I'll read out your question. Okay, I'll, I'll read out your question then. In an era of geoeconomics and where the Indo-Pacific region holds the most growth potential, what is Britain's business model and its relations with China going to be? And how is the Hong Kong factor going to affect that, affect that business model? Well, um, clearly the fact that these countries, China and indeed the Asia-Pacific region in general are growing so fast uh, means that it's extremely important in terms of our own growth and particularly our exports 
for us to be involved in those kinds of countries. Uh, and, and this comes back to the central question about this Cold War model in our relationship to China. We are a very, very, uh, to, to return to the cliche, we are a very open economy. Right? We have an enormous amount of money coming in and out, an enormous number of our companies deal with other countries, an enormous amount of investment comes in from other countries. So it's perhaps more difficult for us than it is from almost any other major economy to choose to try to turn away from the opportunities in places like China. At the same time, quite reasonably, and I think in this, you know, I'm, I'm not a supporter of really at all of this current government, yet, but I do have some admiration for the positions they've tried to take on Hong Kong and to some extent positions they've tried to take on Xinjiang. And I think that it is important uh, for us to begin uh, collectively to continue to make those arguments. I, I would not want us to become so undignified that we felt that we were unable uh, to articulate serious concerns of values and morality, uh, and that somehow all of that was sacrificed simply to trade. I don't even think it's politically possible. I mean, it, you can see, for example, that attempts to do that in terms of arms sales to Saudi Arabia and then their use in Yemen was ultimately unsustainable with the British public. I mean, it, it creates huge political turmoil at home if you try to pretend that you can simply ignore its use of rights and values uh, for the sake of trade. Right, the two last questions, one is very short and one is a bit longer. The very short one I'm going to read out now from Jake Benford. It'll make, make us many of us smile, I think. Uh, could you imagine Rory rejoining the government one day, perhaps under Keir Starmer? Please don't say no. <laughs> Um, I think it's a lovely question. I mean, I think the the uh, the I, I, realistically, I don't think anybody's ever going to uh, <laughs> give me any of these kinds of opportunities. I think, uh, for very good reasons, Britain is a country with strong, uh, responsible parties, and I'm somebody who finds political parties pretty difficult. And uh, as a result, I'm likely not to find myself being offered any of those positions by anybody. But thank you for the thought. I know you don't rule it out as completely impossible. No, no, I'd love to be. I mean, obviously, I would love to be foreign secretary. Anybody wants to be foreign secretary. I just don't think it's going to happen. Right. OK. And my last question is a little bit longer. And I don't we haven't got time to get into a long debate about Afghanistan. But I do recall you taking part in a debate in the pages of Prospect of roughly 15 years ago with Sherard Cooper Coles, who was then British government special envoy for Afghanistan. By the way, I know nothing about Afghanistan myself. He was making the case that the British intervention was achieving quite a lot and was going to be moderately successful. You were much more skeptical about the merits of the British and indeed Western intervention in Afghanistan. That was a long time ago. The Americans are now trying to pull out. Britain's more or less gone. You, you still run, I believe, a charity or help to run a charity in Afghanistan. You spend some time in Afghanistan, although you're based mainly at Yale these days, Rory. Was the Afghan intervention a complete waste of time or has Britain, has the West actually achieved something? Is it, was it a waste of time or did some modest amounts of good come from it all, do you think? Well, fundamentally, the central idea of Iraq and Afghanistan, which is that you can build a nation while fighting an insurgency, so nation building under fire, is madness. You, you can't do that. Um, and most of the ambitions we laid out were totally unrealistic. That doesn't mean that there wasn't an alternative path. And in, in some ways, actually, uh, President-elect Biden tried to sketch out what the alternative was. What he tried to argue for was a light footprint, a long-term light footprint. He was one of the people who stood out against the surge in Afghanistan and had a vision of a very long enduring partnership with Afghanistan where the US would keep planes on the ground in order to stop the Taliban taking the major cities, continue with engage in counter-terrorist activities, provide generous development assistance, um, but not try to believe that with an extraordinary amount of money and soldiers, you were gonna somehow create a gender sensitive multi-ethnic centralized state based on democracy, human rights, rule of law, right? Those sorts of models or visions were insane and it's very odd that our systems didn't realize how insane they were. And partly that's political. I mean, I think if you look at that debate with Sherrod Cooper Coles, it's of course important to understand the poor man was the British ambassador then. So whatever his personal views were, and I suspect he actually agreed with me, he was forced institutionally in a position of defending the indefensible. What I'm worried about, of course, is that we're now in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
which is that we've concluded on the basis of these failures that really there's nothing that can be done at all. Whereas I felt in Bosnia and in Kosovo that there is a form of incremental moderate engagement uh, in intervention which can bring peace, I mean, a messy peace, an uncertain peace, but definitely a big improvement from 37,000 people being killed in Sarajevo by shellfire. And we mustn't lose that insight as we move forward. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rory. That last answer has has several books that contain within it, I think. Perhaps there is a book coming, another book coming on that at some point. Rory, thank you very much. You've covered a huge amount of ground. Thanks to the audience for so many interesting questions. Uh, whatever you end up doing in your career in the future, Rory, whether or not you're Keir Starmer's Foreign Secretary, we hope you'll come back to the CER's platform another time and speak to us on another subject. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.